Welcome everyone. In this video, we will try and replicate the touch splash effect you see in the design in front of you. So as you touch a button, it makes this expanding circular effect. And that is what we will try and replicate in this video. So credit to the user Cuberto on Dribble for the design. By the end of this video, we will create a widget that is tappable. And once tapped, it will create this splash effect. In a future video, we might expand this to actually create a package that we can release on the Pub Store. Okay, let's begin with decoding. In front of us, we basically just have a blank scaffold with a centered column widget. So the first thing that we're gonna do is add a new file and call this splash.dart. And then this will be a stateful widget called splash. And this will control our splash effect. Then we will import material.dart and then return a normal text that just says hello, just to make sure it is working. Then back in our main file, we will include the splash widget. For this, we would need to import the splash file. And we can see it is working. Okay, so what we are gonna be creating today is very, very similar to the inkwell widget provided by Flutter. So the inkwell widget creates a material ripple effect on any child widget that you pass to it. So to begin, what the inkwell widget wants is it wants a child. So we will give it a container and we will provide a width of 100 and a height of 50 and a child that says, click me. So now if we tap the click me, um, it will currently do nothing. What this inkwell wants is it wants a on tap callback method. So for the on tap, we can just define a empty callback function. Now tapping the click me, you can see there is a ripple effect. So this is exactly what we want in our splash widget. So for now, let's uncomment the inkwell. And then we can go to the splash class and we will define a couple of variables. The first will be a widget called child. We will specify this to be final. And the next one will be a gesture tap callback. And we will call this on tap. This is just a type definition function for a void function that doesn't take in any parameters or return anything. Next, we will need to create a constructor that takes in these final parameters to initialize them. So then going back to main dot dot, we will give it a child with a text that says click me. And it will also need the on tap callback function. It is giving an error because we forgot to save the splash file. Currently it is still returning the hello text. What we wanted to return is the child widget. So now it says click me, but if we hit click me, it obviously still doesn't do anything. So in the on tap, we are gonna say print tap. So it still won't actually do anything because we need to handle the tap in this build method over here. So we will wrap this in a new gesture detector widget. A gesture detector is Flutter's built-in widget to handle anything touch related, be it drags or be it taps. We will use the onTap method. What onTap actually wants is it wants a void method that returns nothing. So we're gonna say void and call it handle tap. And then we're gonna pass in the handle tap. Then within the handle tap method, we are gonna say widget.handle tap. So we will be calling the callback method that we passed in. So whatever we pass in here will be called within the handle tap method. So hit save and now if we hit click me, and go to debug console, you can see it says tap. So at the moment we aren't getting any visual feedback that a click is happening. So let's move on to rendering the splash effect. So to achieve this, we will make use of a custom painter. We will call this custom painter splash paint and it extends custom painter. And we will need to override two methods. The first one is the paint method. 
and the second is shoot repaint. The paint method is literally that, that is where the painting happens. And the should repaint is just an optimization method to tell the engine when it should repaint or when it should not. We will explore that later in the video. For now we will set it to always return true. So then in the paint method we are going to say canvas.drawCircle. And this circle method expects an offset, a double which is a radius and then a paint. So let's begin by defining a new paint. Paint has a number of properties that we can set. For now we will only set the color to be equal to black. Next we will give it an offset at the center point. So it will be the size.width divided by two and the size.height divided by two. So these are the X and Y coordinates. And then 4D radius, for now we are just gonna say size.width divided by two. So the entire diameter would be the size.width, but we only want the radius, which is half of that. And for this gesture detector, we will say wrap in new widget, and we will say custom painter, or custom paint. And then we will set the painter property and give the splash paint. Hit save, and then you can see it is actually rendering a circle across the entire widget. So out of interest, how does the custom painter know what the size should be? Well, it takes the size of the child that you pass in. So whatever the size of the gesture detector is, that is the size that will be passed into the size property within the paint method. And that is why it is exactly the width of the gesture detector or the width of the child within the gesture detector. Okay, so we are gonna do a couple of modifications. The first thing that we want to do is give it a radius that we can define. So we're gonna say final double radius, and then we will create a constructor for this. And we will make this a named parameter. So in Splash Paint, we can set the named property to a given value. For now, we will set it to be equal to 100. And then instead of setting the radius to be half of the width, we will pass in the radius property. Okay, it's a little bit too big. Let's make this slightly smaller. Let's set it to 75. Okay, next we want to initialize the paint within the constructor. So we're gonna specify another variable, final paint, and we can call this black paint. And then initialize our black paint over here. What is important here is we're gonna define a style and then instead of saying fill, which is the default, we are gonna set it to stroke. And then replace the new paint with the black paint. Hit save. And now you can see it is actually printing a stroke instead of filling the entire area. So we can define it to have a bigger stroke width. And we can set this equal to seven. Okay, perfect. So we are getting closer to um, the effect that we want. Okay, next we can remove a couple of things and do some cleanup. Next we want to get some animation going. So when we do the click, we want the circle radius to expand from zero to some given value. So in the splash class, the first thing that we want to do is extend it with a single ticker provider state mixin. Then we will override init state and then define an animation controller. Then we will initialize the animation controller with a vsync of this and a duration of 400 milliseconds. Next, we need to define a tween and an animation to animate our radius. Then we will initialize the radius tween with a beginning value of zero and an end value of 50. This will be a tween of type double. And then the animation is going to be the radius tween dot animate and we will give it a curved animation. For now we will just give it a linear curve and the parent we will set to the controller. 
So now we have to find what we need to animate the radius. So to have that expanding circular effect. So next we will do a cascade function and add a listener to the controller. Here we will call the set state. So every time the animation updates, this listener will be called and then set state will be called, making sure that we update all of our animation values. Then we will pass in the radius animation dot value to the painter. Then we will call controller dot forward to start the animation on tap. We will start the controller from zero. Okay, so we need to do a hot restart. And you can see it is already rendering part of the animation. We will fix this in a little bit. But now when we click it, it does the expand effect to go from small to big. So if we look at the design that we want to replicate, we are still a little bit off of what we want. Um, as you can see, it kind of looks like the border expands and then contracts as the radius um, grows. So the initial touch creates this dark effect in the sensor point and then that kind of vanishes and the border also vanishes as it expands. So there's a couple of things we need to add and change to get this effect. So let's jump back to the code. So the first thing we're going to go back into our splash paint class and we're going to define another variable called border size. And give this in the constructor. We will also mark all of the attributes to be required. And then instead of giving a fixed stroke width, we can give the border size. We can actually rename this to be called border width. Okay, perfect. So let's hit save. Okay, now it's failing because we actually need to provide it with this border. So let's pass in the border parameter and we can for now just give it a static value of five. Okay, next we want to create an animation for the border size as well. So we're going to define a new tween and a new animation for the size, for the border width at least. The border tween needs to go from big to small. So we will start off at 25 and end at one. The border animation is going to be exactly the same for now. We are only going to pass in the border tween. So then instead of passing in the fixed value, we are going to pass in the board animation dot value. Hit save. And then also we need to do a hot restart because we changed things that were in init state. And then we can still see that default paint at the start. We will fix this now. But now when we click it, you can see that the radius expands and the border contracts. So this is a lot closer to the effect that we want. But we are not done yet. So if we go in and toggle slow animations, you can see this effect a bit clearer. You can see it contracts the border as the radius expands or as the animation progresses. So let's turn slow animations off. Next, we will fix that initial default painting. So we will define another listener. This will be a status listener. What this listener does, it listens to changes on the animation status. So for example, when we call animation.forward or controller.forward, that is a status change. When the animation finishes, that is a status change. So the add status listener callback expects a animation status parameter. So above we will create a new animation status variable called status. And then within the listener, we will say the status equals the listener value the value that gets passed in by the callback. Next in the splash paint, we are also going to define an animation status variable. And then within the paint method, we will do a check to see what the current status is of the animation. If the animation is currently in the forward state, then we will proceed with the painting. Otherwise, we will paint nothing. 
So if we do a hot restart and the app loads, you can see there's no longer an initial value. But when we click the button, it does nothing. This is because we need to pass in the status parameter. And now when we do a tap, you can see the animation grows and then it vanishes once the animation is completed. So this is getting close to the effect that we want, but not quite there yet. If we go back to the design spec, you can see that for some of the clickable values, the animation appears to be slightly bigger. So I think that will be a cool effect for us to do is depending on the size of the child widget, the animation grows or it contracts. We should also change the sensor point to be at the exact position where the tap occurs instead of just the sensor point of the child. And then there are a couple of small tweaks we can still do to um, improve the final animation. Okay, so I actually skipped ahead. The next section was a bit tedious. So instead I'll just explain to you what we did to get the code to the current state. So as you can see, it, there's a slight change in the appearance. We added another container with a blue back background, and then there's another splash with a icon. So now if we click the icon, it is still what we had previously. But if we click the container, you can see it is not rendering it. That is because we need to change the painter from a normal painter to a foreground painter. Hit save, and now it will actually render in the foreground. The next thing that you might just have observed is that instead of rendering in the center, it is actually rendering at the position that we touch. And you can also see it is slightly bigger. So this um, container over here is obviously bigger than the icon down below. So if we tap the icon, it's a small splash effect. If we tap the container, it's a bigger splash effect. So let's investigate how we get the position and how we get the size. So the first thing that we had to do is in the gesture detector, we had to change the on tap to on tap up. And what on tap up does, it also provides the tap up details. And the tap up details provide you the global position of where you tap. So for example, if I tap over here, it will give me the global position of the screen where I tap. So then in our handle tap method, we have tap up details. And what we do is we create a new render box. We say context.findRenderObject. So this finds the render object of the widget. So for example, this would be the container. And then using global to local, and we pass in the tap details dot global position. This expects an offset. If we pass in the global position, it converts it to the local position. So instead of getting the global position of a tap relevant to the screen, we get the local position that's associated to this widget over here. And then we update the tap position. And the tap position is an offset that we pass into the custom paint. And then in the splash paint, we have the tap position over there. And instead of giving the center point, we give the tap position to say where we should start the center point of the circle. Okay, and then to get the width of the container or the width of the child, it is almost the exact same process. Um, for this, we use the render box and then we say render box dot size dot width. And here we do a basic check to see if the width is bigger than the height. If so, we set the radius equal to the width. And then we have a couple of constraints. We have a max radius and a min radius. And those we define with static constants above here. And these are essentially just because we don't want the max radius to be too big. So for example, if we set, set this to 220 and we do a click, that's slightly too big. That's, I, I don't like that effect. So I cap it at max 120, a minimum of 50. And then depending on this constraint radius that we set, we do a couple of calculations just to say what the width should be and what the um, beginning value for the border width tween should be and what the border beginning value for the end tween should be. These are just values that I played with to get a, a smooth effect and effect that I'm happy with. The last thing that we will do is we will actually change the curve animation. So currently it is set to linear. And for this one, after doing a couple of tests, I'm happy with setting this curve animation to ease. 
and this one to fast out and slow in. So hitting save. And for this, we will also need to do a hot restart because this is within the init state. We can do a tap and I think that's very close to the design that we wanted. And yeah, that is the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed this journey into making this. As I said, in a future video, we might expand this a little bit to also include additional functionality and we can also package this and upload it to the pop store. That said, that is done and I'll catch you in the next video. Cheers.